Okay, good evening. So um, we'll look at this next section um, in Wackerly on large sample confidence intervals. This uses the pivot of standardizing a normal random variable. This is especially goes well with the chapter on point estimators as all four of those point estimators we were able to say had approximately normal distributions when the sample size was not too small. Okay, so suppose we do have um, N of these, right? We have N of these uh, samples with parameter theta. And here is a point estimator theta hat that is approximately normal. So this would work for most, for all four of those from the previous, uh, from the section on point estimators as well for many others. Um, so then, uh, then we can find a, a confidence interval based on the pivotal quantity um, Z, the standardization of theta hat. So then let's let Z equal theta hat minus theta over, this should be squared probably, right? Because usually we put a variance in there um, over um, the standard deviation sigma theta hat. And this should be, again, approximately, we're going to just, we just assume sort of the normality based on the central limit theorem, but those things can be checked too um, to see if they, they may be reasonable or not, or just left that way. Okay, so... Um, for an example, just to start with an easy example, for an example, um, if we want, we know, or we look it up, we know that uh, probability minus two less than Z less than two is approximately uh, point, this is approximately 0.954, I think. And so this is equal to, uh, the probability that minus two is less than theta hat minus theta over. And from here, just manipulate this by multiplying through and um, getting theta in the center there. So this is the probability that, um, let's see, here's the estimator theta hat minus two this is a positive number after you do the manipulation and get it this way. Okay, so this is your theta hat lower bound, theta hat upper bound of a 95% confidence interval for theta. Um, of course, we will have to estimate, we will have to estimate, this is left still, right? Remains, it remains to estimate and it will depend on exactly what sample it is and what estimator we're using and various options from there. So. Um, but, uh, or we might know it, but, um, or be told something, uh, to use, but, um, this is best not tried to handle this, uh, generally we should, um, we won't make any rules for this, but cover this with examples now. So let's do, uh, an example just to see, and, uh, this is a largely review, but it's important to set this up. I think, and to see it set up this way. So suppose we have y1 to yn, i, i, d, e, y, i, we'll call it mu, and that's it. I don't think I have a name for the variance yet. Um, yeah, let's, let's name the variance to, let's say, uh, variance y, i equals sigma squared, but we're not claiming the sample that y1 is normal, just 
that n is not too small, okay? So um, then automatically, right? We know a, a good estimator for, for mu here is y bar. So a, so we can write this right down from the work above. So a 0.95 confidence level interval. So 0 0.95, or you could write 95% confidence level interval. You can just mix these words up pretty much. Interval for mu is what's a good estimator for mu? Y bar. So Y bar would be the point estimator minus two standard deviation of the estimator. So we would just let's notate it like this for now. And Y bar plus two. Where we still have to estimate, um, we still have to estimate this, right? This, we don't, we didn't say what this should be yet. Okay. But Y bar is just the sample mean of the sample. So uh, we know from chapter six uh, or from chapter, uh, what, what was it? Eight point um, three, I guess, on point estimators or 8.4 that the standard error of the sample mean is just the sigma over the square root of n or but also write it like this, sigma squared over n. And so in this way here, we can see that uh, we might estimate sigma squared with s squared, which we know is unbiased, and we know the variance of s squared also goes small when n goes large. So let's just write a typical good estimator for sigma squared is the sample variance because it has those two properties. It's unbiased and the variance of S squared itself goes small as N goes large. Okay, so for a second example, so this is it, right? You just, you can compute S squared, you can put it in here and you can get your 95% confidence interval for mu, okay? All I need is my data, compute S squared, compute Y bar. I have a 95% confidence interval for mu. Okay, so let's do another example. Um, a different, maybe a different way to bound the, uh, to keep the radius in check, not let it get too small. So for a second example, suppose we have uh, Y1, yn and let y equal the sum of these and suppose the yi's are ii d bernoulli p so they're ones and zeros and we saw that y over n is a good unbiased estimator for p so we saw that previously, um, y, y over n is an estimator for P. It is unbiased. And we showed that in the one of the last videos. So um, again, um, here, I'm sorry, Y over, let's see, Y is the sum, right. So Y over n is, um, is an unbiased estimator for P, right. Okay, then we can assume if N is not small, hold on, I gotta just do something. Yeah, so if N is not small, then um, we, we have, Y uh, being a binomial 
n is not small is approximately normal, y over n is approximately normal. So y over n is approximately normal with mean p. And variance would be what here? The variance would be um, p1 minus p over n, right? Okay, so what can we do now? So a two, say a 95% confidence interval is equal to the probability um, y over n. That's my estimator for p, and I'm going to take off two standard errors of y over n less than p less than y, y over n plus two standard errors of y over n. Okay, and y over n we can compute and sigma y over n is um, can be dealt with two ways. So where we estimate, we have two choices. We could, let's put this in, we could one, estimate with, so the exact value of this is the square root of this right in here. But what I could do is since y over n is an estimator for p, correct? we would just use that in here, right? So I could have y over n, one minus y over n over n. Um, probably simplify that or two bound sigma y over n with uh, well, it's max when P is a half. So um, I'd have uh, the square root of a quarter divided by N. So that's one half, one over the square root of N, or I could just have written that in the denominator with the two there. Um, and so for two, and for two then, we would have the probability of y over n minus uh, two sigma y over n. So that would be minus one over the square root of n, right? When I multiply that by two and then less than little p, less than y over n plus one over square root of n. And now even instead of writing approximately 0.95, we can say greater than or equal to 0.95 because one over the square root of n is going to be an upper bound on the radius here. Okay. Um, so I think um, we can keep going a little. We could just do this for other cases as well. Um, there's all sorts of uh, cases we could do. Um, let me just pause it for a second and we'll be right. Okay, so I changed the color so that you would be, maybe feel refreshed. Okay, so maybe we don't always want a 95% uh, two-sided confidence interval, as in both the previous two, it's very common, but you could want something else. Um, and it doesn't really matter. It's always the same procedure. You're using this pivotal quantity here, uh, this standardization of Z, as long as it's justified that, um, that theta hat is approximately normal. Okay, and you will have to generally, in general, estimate the standard error of theta hat. All right, so I have a, a two more examples. We'll just do these examples and stop. So suppose I have um, 
y1. And for some reason, I put in an actual number here, y31, iid. I don't know that they're normal, but I'm going to say EYI is mu, just, just to label these, and the variance of YI is sigma squared. And I have two unknown parameters, so both unknown, both unknown. Okay, um, and we want, the problem says, find lower bound for uh, mu. So find a lower bound, let's call it mu hat L for mu, so that probability mu is greater than mu hat L is equal to, and just pick pick something else here so that it would, instead of 0.95, we'll pick 0.85. All right, okay. All right, well, um, we have our pivotal quantity Z. So what is it about Z that would give me a, what probability involving Z gives me 0.85? Um, well, I want this point here so that this is 0.85 over here, right? It does turn out I want this one and not this one over here. I was talking about this in the last lecture and I can't always tell this, from I try one thing and then see if it works. If not, I try the other. But we have the probability that Z is less than uh, Q norm 0.85, which turns out is roughly 1.04, is equal to 0.85. A little past one. You may remember it's about 34% of the probability is between zero and one. And half is between minus infinity and zero, so it makes sense. All right, all right, all right, all right. Okay, 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 so 1.04 is that probability. All right, so how do I relate that back to mu hat L and mu? Okay, shouldn't be too bad, right? So we have 0.85 equals probability Z less than, 1.04, by the way, not exactly, of course. And this is just equal to the probability. Now, what is standard normal? Okay, it's mu. Sorry, I want to put the Y bar in here. Make it super clear what's going on. Okay, it's the probability Y bar minus mu over sigma Y bar right? This is standard normal is less than 1.04. And this is equal to the probability that after I multiply through by sigma y bar here and um, add and subtract, I get this is the probability that mu is greater than, right? Multiply through, subtract, add, so greater than y bar plus 1.04 sigma y bar. Okay, for sigma y bar, I'm going to want to estimate it. So for sigma y bar, we will use approximately equal to the square root of s squared over n, which is 31 in this case, and I actually did this for some data, and I have uh, y bar equals 48.7, and s squared equals 8.9, and um, it's equal to 0 0.54. So we get a 85% confidence level lower bound for mu is forty-eight point seven 
minus one point, sorry, plus, right? Sorry, 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 plus, plus, uh-oh, wait a second. Fuck, if I multiply through there, minus, 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 right? Minus, see the problem? Did you see it when I was doing it? Okay, right, I multiply through, add the mu, subtract. Okay, that makes a lot more sense, right? I'm on the left side. That must have been frustrating watching me ramble on like that. Um, you can leave a comment if you see mistakes, please do. Um, Okay, mistakes they are good to have comments. Okay, so I have 48.7 minus, yeah, much better, right? 1.04 times 0 0.54. And this is equal to um, 48.212. Okay, well, um, this came from here, which came from the actual data. And um, this says that the um, the mean, this is the lower bound for the mean with 85% probability. So here I have mu L hat 48.212. Here's, I'm saying mu is in here. with probability, probability mu is in here. Now, this is the thing, I can't say this, right? I can't say the probability mu is in here is 85%. I can only say this is an 85% confidence interval. In other words, the way I computed this number, if I were to totally do another sample from here, the same size, the same distribution, the same system, I would get another number. And on average, 85% of these, for 85% of these, mu falls to the right over here. Okay, so this is what this is saying. Okay, mu falls to the right with an 85% confidence. By the way, the actual data was generated randomly in R using the following command. Um, I just said, I called it raw. And I set this equal to three times R norm 31 plus 49. In other words, I generated 31 normal random variables with variance nine and mean 49. So the, the actual mean is, is to the right here for what we computed by a little. All right, um, let's see. I think we can do one more last example. Suppose I have X1 to Xm, IID Bernoulli P1, Y1 to Yn, IID Bernoulli P2. And then we know X over M minus Y over N is an estimator for P1 minus P2. So let's write it like that. It's unbiased too. We know it's unbiased and it has low variance or variance that can be made low as M and N get big. So, um, and that if M and N are big, it's approximately normal as well. So we have everything we want. And um, we can maybe just remind ourselves that, um, let's say, X over M minus Y over N is approximately normal with mean P1 minus P2 and with variance, um, let's just call it sigma for now, x over m minus y over n, and we can fill this in later. We'll put the square here, 
because we usually write it that way as squared. Now, only thing is that um, before we go on um, here, yeah, we're all good here. So what does the problem say? The problem says, so let's write approximately here. Problem says find a two-sided, meaning I want to use the point estimator. Oh, I know what I wanted to say. X is the binomial, right? X is the sum of these, as in the last example. Y is the sum of these. Okay, so find a two-sided um, 97%, just to change it up, confidence interval for um, P1 minus P2 the difference in the probabilities. These are zeros and ones, right? They're one with probability P1. These are zero and ones, one with probability P2. Maybe they are the number of votes for a certain candidate in two different districts. We wanna see if one district favors a certain candidate, something like this. Okay, we're almost there. Um, you recall from the previous lecture on point estimators that sigma x over m minus y over n is equal to square root p1 1 minus p1 over m plus p2 1 minus p2 over n and we could approximate this the same way that we mentioned before by using x over m for, for p1 and using y over n for p2. So we could do that. Okay, we could approximate it or we could just say that this error will be less than or equal to and put the maximum in here, which would make this a quarter, this a quarter, then it would factor out and I could write it like this. And I'm not saying we should always do this, but if we expect it to be close anyway, why not just do this? And then you don't have to write approximate and it's going to be pretty close as we saw when we did that problem, right? In class. Okay, almost there, almost there, almost there. We want this 97% two-sided confidence interval. So to do that, I know I need um, Q norm. I'm going to split the probability for Z then. I need, uh, this to be 97% in the middle here. So this should be 0 0.015 and this should be 0 0.015. So we need, what do we need? We need Q norm, point say 0 0.015, which is minus 2.17. And by the symmetry, this will be 2.17 minus 2.17 approximately. And so we have 0 0.97 equals probability minus 2.17 less than Z equals the estimator X over M minus Y over N minus P1 minus P2 thing I'm trying to estimate, divided by this sigma here, which we already computed. Let's just put it in like this for now, x over n minus y over n. And this should be less than 2.17. Okay. And I can now substitute this in here. And I get this is equal to the probability that, um, well, we're we're done basically, right? That we're we're basically done. The probability that um, x m minus y n minus two point one seven times uh, one half square root. 1 over m plus 1 over n, right? So here's my estimator and here's my radius. I'm subtracting this off, is less than p1 minus p2. 
is less than, here's my estimator, Okay, there's the confidence interval. Here's my statement. There's a 9.97 probability that the probability, um, point, there's a 0.97 probability that the thing I'm trying to estimate involves two parameters, but it's only a single number, the difference in the two population probabilities um, is between these two numbers. Note, these are the random quantities here. This is a totally true probability and sensible mathematical statement in probability, right? Once I actually find these numbers, then I have to switch over to the confidence interval language and say, I have computed a confidence interval. Here is what it is. So I would plug in this value here, this value here, and I see I get this evenly centered confidence interval. And then I say I have a 97% confidence interval. Let's write this down. Note the above is a true math statement. Substituting our data. we may report a 97% confidence interval uh, that has two numbers, right? Two numbers. <laughs> I'm trying to think of how to write it. So that is, um, an actual interval that is two numbers. Let's write it little x over m minus little y over n minus whatever this number is. And I have one half. And on the other side, I have the plus. So let's write it plus or minus. Okay. Where the lowercase are intended to represent the actual count of ones in each population. All right, thanks. See you on the next one.